still good to have a music fan mentality. I think right. that's really important. I think when you lose that, it, it, it hurts what you do. You know, you still need to have a music fan mentality. And that's what I still have, I think. I still, I still love music. I still get excited over music. And, and more so when you don't know the inner workings of everything, you know, when you didn't program the hi-hat in the studio, it, it's good to have that, that then you get more excited, you know. Ghost Cult Magazine welcomes in, we're, we're honored to welcome in Reese Fulber of Frontline Hello. Assembly and many other things. Hello. Hello. How have you, have you been? How's everything? Cold. <laughs> cold in the turbid north of Vancouver. Uh, yeah, it's really cold right now. It's colder than normal. There's snow everywhere. I had to dig a path for my, my car. So we'll see what happens when I try and move it later. But it's, uh, I kind of live back into sort of a rural area. I'm at the top of a hill. So whenever there's a lot of snow, it's, it's, it's always a little treacherous getting in and out of here. Because I'm like up two hills, like up one hill and then another one. And so it's always like a little sketchy up here this time of year. But it, at the same time, it's very quaint. And, you know, I have a wood stove and chop wood and you get it cozy. And it's, it's so it's kind of cool, especially, you know, I know a lot of people love snow at Christmas time. And uh, it's on paper, it's a cool idea. But then when you got to like have stuff to do and then the, the roads are all messed up, it's not necessarily what you want but uh we'll see it's it's i like it though i like the um you know pretending i'm a fur trapper or something it kind of, it's kind of appealing lifestyle i mean i'm sure it has its pluses like i said i spent uh, we said offline i've spent some time living in new hampshire and new england i spent some time visiting Maine. you know it's worse over there it's colder it, yeah. it the, the west coast isn't as cold as like as over there i mean it's pretty cold right now but it won't stay this cold all winter like it does over there so yeah i've never been uh in canada i've never been further west than montreal so that's i know yeah montreal is relatable is, <laughs> montreal is absolutely brutal in the winter it's such a cool city and every time i go there i'm like man this is i really like it it's a little bit like europe but it's in north america and everyone just says yeah the winter and you're like oh yeah <laughs> i forget it <laughs> <laughs> and I moved, I moved from the East Coast to California. So I'm in the Bay Area and uh, the worst. Oh, I lived in California rain. for like 15 years. And it's like, and then came back to Canada. And it's, it's like, at first I was, you know, really excited. And now over time, you're like, oh, man, I lived in California a little too long. Once you, like California is a funny place, especially LA. Once you live in LA a little too long, you're kind of doomed. You, you, you can't like live anywhere else, right? So I hear that about New York, my hometown also. So it's all good. I get it. This is a pretty big occasion. I've been a longtime fan. This is a big deal for me without fanboying out too much. Obviously we're here to, you know, we're here to talk about the new remastered version of a 30 year old album on Wax Tracks that is awesome. And we're going to unpack that in a second. But I wanted to just, you've had a huge, like a very busy year. I feel like you must always be working to put out this amount I mean, of stuff. This doesn't feel like that busy a year, to be honest. If it is, that's great because I don't know. I mean, I've always done, I mean, I've always kept busy. So um, I feel like by, you know, my previous standards, this wasn't that busy a year, I guess. But if you say so, I, I, I honestly, I lose track sometimes of, of what it, what I'm doing. I'm always kind of, I try and stay in the moment a lot. And um, I think that's creatively a better way to work. I know like when I work on my own music and stuff, I try not to look backwards too much and keep moving on. So if you say it was busy, I will take your word for it. But I think it was just a normal. It was just, you know, we're lucky in the pandemic. We kept really busy because, you know, a lot of bands that maybe depend more on touring, it was really tough. But we've always been pretty, you know, at least I've always been pretty studio heavy. So the pandemic was actually pretty productive. I got a lot of music done. And uh, so I was very lucky in that regard. So I think it's kind of still going that same way. And, you know, we did a couple tours this year for the first time in a little while it's still a little weird to be honest and when we toured in may and then i still play solo shows on my own here and there and um so you know there's definitely more live action than there was for a little while but the studio we always i always keep working at a pretty good clip so 
yeah, it was, I think, a fairly normal year. I don't know. I, th- I think I take it for granted sometimes how much, you know, I'm working and stuff, you know, because the money in the middle part of the music industry just disappeared. So now it's the high end level, the high end part of the music business, like the absolute top tier of pop music and hip hop. And, and that's un- relatively unchanged. But the middle section, say where Fear Factory and Paradise Lost and groups like that, that part was impacted, you know, really severely. So that's that's where I used to, you know, do most of my work. And so that changed, you know, it pushed everything into home studios and stuff like that. So I feel like also over the course of your career, and if you want to just talk about Frontline, you and Bill always had sort of an aspect to both of your work together and apart where that's just you absolutely I, I imagine you had your own home studios you must be able you know the facility to do remixes to do solo projects to do side projects to do guest things just in general to generate work you have to have your own usable recordable studio at a pro level anyway for many years well yeah and i had a studio when i lived in la which was a proper studio where we, you know I, I did we did mechanized by fear factory there and actually, no, we did Mechanized, we did Industrialist, we did parts of Genexus there, a bunch of Genexus there. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, that, that was the shift where it was like, listen, you got to have your own studio. It, 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 interestingly enough, the guy who told me this, who prophesized this to me was the uh, is this guy named Andy Farrow, who's a manager of Devon Townsend and Paradise Lost and Opath and uh, soil work. I think he manages a bunch of bands. He's a friend of mine. He's a, he's a pretty astute man. And he told me after I did the, the last album I did with Paradise Lost, which was in Requiem, I believe, is when he told me, you got to get your own studio. These records cost too much money. Going into studios is not sustainable. He was the one who told me that. And so that was around the time I set up a studio in Los Angeles and kind of transitioned into being the one-stop shopping spot. And I sort of ended my relationship with, with those guys because, you know, I'm living in Los Angeles and it's just, just, you know, the travel alone, it just makes everything too expensive. And they had to work with people who are closer to them. And, and so he, he was the one that told me this is coming. And, you know, it's like, I think what he was trying to say was like, like, we like working with you, but it's just costing us too much money to with all the background, you know, um, all the uh, ancillary costs, I guess you could say. So he was the one that gave me that uh, prediction that, you, you know, this is how you need to, you know, stay competitive. You know, you got to have a studio and you got to have a, a place, you know, where you can people pay one fee and then the record comes out of that on the end, you know, and it was hard for people that were used to working in the old way we worked where we had engineers, we had studios, everything was the old, old way, you know, and it got completely, you know, killed. Tactical made in the old way. (laughs) We need to call up Andy and get the lottery numbers from him because clearly he's got the magic eight ball. We don't have. He's a smart guy. I, I, he's a smart guy. He's uh, he's one of the better managers I've ever seen in, uh, in that, that world. So. Right on really quick. I, I did just interview Dino Cazares a few months ago when we talked about recoded the new fear factory remix album. They've done a few remix albums. I think yeah. you, you had a tremendous impact on that band across their career, across your own, uh, you know, I think it's been a symbiotic, hopefully fulfilling relationship Dino, you know, raves about you, of course, and says you're the, you know, the, the secret sauce of a lot of records. And, you know, he's so grateful to have worked with you. Uh, you know, you've gotten to work with two versions of that band with and without Dino. So I was always wondering about like you didn't, uh, you know, it was not a thing. Oh, yeah. Not- I, for- I forget about Archetype. I, I only did keyboards on Archetype. So honestly, I wasn't around the actual sessions. They just gave me some songs and I did keyboards on it so I sort of wasn't that deep in that record as as normal like I was I think I was only at the actual studio they were recording at just briefly one time I think just to say hi or something you know so I forgot about yeah archetype I just did keyboards so I didn't have as much of a hand in that record I was just like adding keyboards to a few songs and that was a strange time you know, I mean, Fear Factories had so many 
it's just such a complex, dramatic history, you know. Um, honestly, it's a shame because, you know, you see it from afar with bands, how pe they get wrapped up in, in, you know, in just these internal politics that are just crippling, you know. And, you know, I'm sitting one step removed going, can't we all just get along, man, you know. But, you, you know, it, it, things it's like family, right? You, you spend so much time in proximity and, and then, then like riffs ferment, you know, and it's just, it, it roots into people's feelings and it's really hard to undo sometimes. So, I mean, I wish everybody the best all the time. I have no ill will to anyone connected with that band, you know? Absolutely. And no disrespect here. We love Burton and Dino equally. It, We've given it, equal time to both, you know, those it, guys. And it I'm, I'm proud of Dino of what he's doing now. Yeah. Yeah. It frustrates me a little bit. And, uh, and it's hard for fans to understand, I think, because they want the whatever record that they reacted to the most, that's you know people have that image in their head and that's what they want and it's just not that simple sometimes people are complicated you know <laughs> oh, so, so so much so uh, outside of the artistry of just being in a band yeah. you no know, you know that yourself you were out of front line for many years and then now back in since 2014 gratefully and uh, well i think i think that sort of happened partly because the producing i think i just wanted to be more of a producer at that time you know i mean i put in you know, a lot of time and a lot of touring with Frontline. And I just felt like I just wanted to do something else. You know, I wanted, you know, I was getting a lot of requests for production. I mean, especially after Demanufacture. Um, and, you know, in fact, I, I actually turned down tons of work, which in hindsight was probably foolish. Um, but yeah, that, you know, that record opened up so many doors and I just wanted to do new things. You know, I was just like, I wanted to be in different, a different circle of music for a while. You know, I enjoyed, you know, sort of, I enjoyed the metal scene. I liked the camaraderie the metal scene had. And uh, it was just cool to be, just do new things. I mean, that's, that's, you know, and what happens is you, yeah, you just need to mix it up. You know, it's like in sports where you got to play, you got to trade players. They got to move around. You know, it's the same thing. It's like, I just wanted to do something different. And it was, it, it was just exciting. You know, it's exciting when you have phone calls coming in from different people. And then, and then if I stayed in the band, I wouldn't be able to do it, you know? Um, so, I mean, it, it actually it was a double-edged sword because I remember Fear Factory wanted me to go to Australia to play the Big Day Out Festival with them. And I had another production booked and I couldn't go. And they're like playing with Prodigy and stuff in Australia. And it was like some total amazing, like one of the best Big Day Outs ever. And I go, like, oh man, I can't go. It's because I was, you know, I'd already uh, made commitments to another band and, you know, so, but it was, it was an exciting time. So you just, I just wanted to move on to other things because you know, Frontline was, you know, it be, it become so, you know, it, it wasn't, it, I guess, I don't want to say it wasn't exciting anymore, but the last show I played with Frontline was such a great, uh, we played at Roskilde Festival in Denmark, which is a proper festival. It's not an, a genre festival, you know what I mean? It's not like a metal festival or a goth festival. It's like a festival festival like uh like a european lollapalooza or something so and after we played that show i just thought like there's nowhere else to go now except down <laughs> so i just thought this is a good note to leave and move on to different things because i just thought at that moment I, I was like this is as good as i think it's as good as it's going to be with frontline you know playing this kind of festival with this kind of audience and i just thought it would be a nice time to you know, now moved to another chapter. So, and then when I came back to Frontline, it was exciting again. So it kind of all made sense, you know, like being away for a while. And then I went on the road with one of my, my Conjure One project doing some support slots. And then it started, then I started going, hey, you know what, this, this is cool again. You know, it's exciting. This is exciting me again. So it, it was good to have the break, I think.
And, and to be honest, Frontline made one of their best records ever without me. Echo Genetic is fantastic album. <laughs> and honestly, it's my favorite material to play live is the songs from that album that I didn't work on because I get a different perspective on it. It sounds more exciting to me because I didn't work on it. Because sometimes when you work on music, it's like, it's not that you're tired of it, but you're just like, you've heard it so much and you have no perspective on it and you don't have that outside, you don't feel that energy from an outside perspective. That's why I like playing those songs that I didn't work on because I get that excitement almost. It's hard to explain. <laughs> No, that's beautiful. And I really appreciate hearing that. And uh, it probably shows also like live because the thing you've played 10,000 times or the song everybody's waiting all night to hear. Yeah, I love you know, there, you, it's in your oh, bones, you know, it with your eyes closed, but you know, something that excites you that's a challenge. Oh, yeah. There's a song on Echo Genetic we played live called Blood. And it's got these major chords. And it's just I think Bill did it with Jared, one of the other guys. I guess a really good tune, man. I love playing this. <laughs> it's honestly one of my favorite songs to play live with Frontline. It's like, and I didn't have anything to do with it. So I'm a pro, because it's still good to have a music fan mentality. I think right. that's really important. Um, I think when you lose that, it, it, it hurts what you do. You know, you still need to have a music fan mentality. And, uh, and that's what I still have, I think. I still I still love music. I still get excited over music and and more so when you don't know the inner workings of everything, you know, when you didn't program the hi hat in the studio, it, it's good to have that that then you get more excited. You know, I think I think, you know, what I mean. I do really quick before we get into unpacking the record a little bit. I did want to ask one thing that I've always been curious about, which is your process for remixing a track uh -huh. or an album for anybody. Typically, how does that begin? If you don't mind revealing a little bit, pulling the curtain back um, me a little bit. Well, it kind of depends because if I'm doing Fear Factory, <laughs> it's a different process because Dino's pretty involved in everything. So Dino will sort of come to me sometimes and maybe give me an example or he'll sort of say, we kind of want something like this. Okay. So my process with Fear Factory is pretty different to how I normally do remixes. Normally, when I'm doing remixes, sometimes I don't even listen to the song, like, or I listen to it once and that's it. And then I just take the vocals and just start building something. Um, but with Fear Factory, there's usually, uh, Dino's usually kind of giving me a little direction at the beginning. Um, there was one remix I did in the method that I use for people that aren't called Fear Factory. And I think that was the remix they had the hardest time with. I think it's just a bonus track now or something because it's very different to the original song. It's a completely different take, right? So, um, so there's sort of two different things. Like remixing for Fear Factory is sort of its own, own thing a little bit. And, and also I think Dino has a concept for how he wants the record to be. He still wants the guitars. He still wants it to be, you know, metal-ish, I guess you could say. So I understand that. So it's, they're, yeah, they're two separate things. But, you know, when I do stuff outside Fear Factory, yeah, I'm not even, like, I'll listen to the song once and that's it. And then I'll just take maybe a vocal and maybe one other element and then just almost make something new out of it. So... It kind of depends. However, I just did a remix for uh, Host. Nick and Greg from Paradise Lost have a new band. And I heard, I heard it online and I was like, man, I really like this. It's cool. So I emailed Nick, said, hey, man, I want to do a remix. I like it. So I just did a remix for them. And that one still got a lot of the song in it. So, but it, I, you know, I was trying to make it more commercial. I think that's the key. If you're trying to make something a little more commercial, you're usually keeping more of the song. But if I'm doing techno remixes or something where that doesn't matter, then I'm creating a new piece. So I think that's probably a better way to describe it. If it's meant to be something like more commercial, you keep more of the elements. But if you're making like something a little more, you know, abstract and artistic, then everything's out the window and it's completely something new. 
I'm over here taking notes. And uh, yeah, great stuff. I, you know, thanks for sharing all that. But you no know, problem. mainly let's let's now shift gears correctly to talk about frontline and tactical neural implant and this amazing new vinyl remaster, uh, which you worked with Neely again, which is amazing. And uh, of course, he knows the material because he's oh, yeah. literally an extra member of the band, basically, at this point. I, I mean, Greg had a lot to do with uh, um, the presentation of those albums, um, the polish. Um, I mean, you know, we came in with the music basically as it is on the record, but just having that really it, like clear, polished production just elevates everything. Um, I, I know that you know people ask me what kind of equipment did you use on those records and like Costa Grip and Tactical and are you know when I describe the modest setup we had people are always like wow that record sounds so great and I'm sort of like forgetting the part where yeah but we mixed it on like an SSL <laughs> console in a top of the line studio so honestly yeah that's that's where a lot of that sound comes from but it was made on relatively modest compared to what people use now it was relatively modest setup when we wrote caustic and tactical in bill's apartment he had like a, a he had like a spare bedroom and we had some gear set up in there and that's how we wrote both those records with yeah like very modest setup but we would take that modest setup into a not modest studio <laughs> like a very nice studio and set everything up and put it through you know top of the range mixing desk and everything and then use two inch tape to record uh elements of the music and then all the vocals so it was you know they were done at a high level it, like the studios we we're mixing in Va vancouver is always been has always been a uh, it, it was a recording destination in the 80s. I don't know if you're aware of that, or, but like Bon Jovi, Aerosmith, uh, The Cult. I mean, they made a lot of big records in Vancouver at a place called Little Mountain Sound. So Vancouver always had a world-class studio culture. Mm. And we were definitely beneficiaries of that uh, culture, making records in Vancouver because Vancouver had some really good studios, world-class professional studios. And that's where we were mixing all our 1990s records. Every one of those records was made in a top tier studio. So had a lot to do with how those records sound. Right on. I remember first hearing Tactical in the clubs in New York City at places that are way longer Limelight. than- Limelight. Limelight, Tunnel, yeah. The Bank was one of my favorites in the lower I love side. Limelight. Limelight was crazy. Uh, you know, it was you it was just banana balls going in there. Um, and um Bat Cave is another one. Uh, so many cool memories. And uh this was your second record with the band, right? So this I think is so my second. Technically, I worked on some of the earlier, more underground records, but this is my second professional, I would say, record with the band when we're doing things with like budgets and deadlines and you know all that kind of stuff so yeah second professional record with the band i would say i fully uh i was no longer working at starbucks anymore i was working at starbucks when we did costa grip wow. and after the subsequent tours and we got a publishing deal then i <laughs> and i was no longer working anymore so we were totally focused and honestly those first few years were pretty they went pretty quick 1989, they were touring the Gas Senses and Crossfire record, which Bill did with another guy named Michael Balch, who was a little older than me and an accomplished musician and, you know, professional guy. And then I did the tour with them as a teenager. I was 18 on that tour. And then Michael got pulled into the vortex of ministry in Chicago. The Chicago vortex uh, ate Michael, basically. And Bill wanted to make another record. He couldn't get hold of Michael. He just said, you want to do it? I'm there, <laughs> right? And so that's kind of what started that. And so we made like all those records and then the, the tour and the record, it was all pretty bang, bang in those days. Uh, but you know, without the internet, everything seems to, time moves differently with the internet. Time moves faster and less happens, you know? Mm. 
Um, but pre-internet, a year seemed like a long time, you know? And so, you know, Costa Grip was what, 1990? We did the tours, 91. And then after those tours, we right away did tactical neural implant, late 91. So it was all pretty quick, all of that. And we made Costa Grip with almost, I mean, tactical with almost the same setup. We had an Atari computer and a Kai sampler, a mini Moog, a Pro One Sense, you know, not a ton of gear. I think tactical, we had a little money, so we bought a couple of new toys, but still relatively modest. And then, you know, we would just, I'd go over to Bill's apartment. We sit in that spare room and we would write, you know, we'd work every day. We always treated it very uh, job-like, I guess you could say. It's like, hey, we got to get in every day and work. And, and that's how we got all that stuff done because Bill was, this one thing Bill was good at, Bill was always had the mentality of, you know, very uh, like workmanlike, like, okay, come on, let's, we can't screw around. We got to, you know, get this done. And so that's, that was a good part of it is Bill always wanted to, you know, work, turn it over you know, and then we get on the road. And so it was a good system we had going. So making tactical, we're very much in the zone, I guess you could say, you know. Nice. I, I think I always assumed or presumed in, incorrectly that those Akai sounds were a, a, a DX, like a Yamaha or something in that generation. But now that you said Akai. We didn't use, we didn't use any, because gas sensors and crossfire was all heavy with that DX7 80s kind of sound. And and then when I came into picture, we didn't, we did something, you know, we kind of changed the sound a little bit. I get, I think it was just what I was bringing in. And, and I think Bill was like, yeah, cool. Let's do it this way. And we kind of stopped using a lot of that sound. And um, I mean, honestly, we're still doing everything basically with two synthesizers and an Akai and then putting it into the Akai sampler because, you know, we're using old, old synths with no memory, patch memory. So we'd make the sound, sample it. And that's kind of how we used to do everything. And that's why it's hard to go back and you know, access this stuff because I don't know where the discs are for the machines and everything was put on two inch tape and two inch tape is very costly in today's world to, to take and start doing transfers of two inch tape. I mean, it's pretty costly. And, you know, it's no one's got the time or the budget to go and start going through these old tapes. And also tape doesn't last forever. And there's you would have to there's like things you have to do to make the tape still. It's called baking or something. I'm not even exactly sure what it is, but there's so much involved. They literally it, bake the tapes. Yeah, to, I to told get them Bill, to work again. <laughs> yeah, I sort of told Bill, you know, I almost be better off just kind of reprogram it all. It would be quicker than trying to go through all that. So, so that's, that's the only problem with a lot of that old material is it's like, and, and DAT tapes, DAT tapes with the masters, those things are not reliable. There's pops and clicks. I mean, we thought digital would be like, you know, this pristine flawless format, but it's not really. So it's just hard to get back everything. You know, we're lucky we had the masters and we got all that stuff the way we did. Yeah, the band has been very fortunate uh, to have, you know, Wax Tracks come in here and, you know, put this record out again and have Greg come in and work on it. What do, have you, can you hear a difference in, in the original to now? I know there was several vinyl pressings over the years, one not too long ago from Roadrunner, an original I didn't think I years ago. That. I don't think I heard that one. The new, the new mastering, I mean, everything's different. Now. Everything's louder. Like modern mastering is much louder than it used to be. Um, so I guess it's better. Um, but I mean, I think those old records all sounded pretty good. It's just that the way music has changed over the years, everything's gotten louder. So now if you put out an old master, a lot of people will think it doesn't sound as good because it's not as loud, right? Which is... I'm not going to get into that argument, but it's not better. <laughs> it's just louder, you know. So that's sort of what, you know, usually has to get adjusted is. Uh, it, but the I mean, I remember the old masters did sound pretty good. I mean, we had Greg, who's an outstanding engineer. We had 
I, I can't remember who mastered tactical originally, if it was Brian Gardner. We used to use this guy who mastered like NWA and stuff like that. And he was awesome. And uh, so I can't quite remember, but the main difference now is stuff just is, is louder. You know, that's, mm. that's really the only difference. I mean, analog tape and vinyl has a bigger dynamic range in digital formats. So it technically should sound better, but just music has changed and the way people consume music has changed. So you have to sort of alter it to fit into that. Indeed. I will say Tactical does have some of my absolute, just to give some uh, props for a second, some of my favorite stuff Bill has ever done is on this record. And some of my favorite frontline songs are all, happen to be on this record. So when the PR approached me about chatting with you about it, I was like, oh, yes, please. Can well, I? I mean, I always wanted to make stuff commercial, right? I always wanted to make it a little poppy or something. And Tactical is where you really hear that. Mm. where it was like you know um i mean i sort of always liked melodic music before i got really into industrial music i used to like stuff like omd and like uh yeah i didn't know depeche mode till later but i always liked like and then post-punk and all so i always like music with a lot of melody and you know bill too um so tactical i think i was trying to inject more of that in there and then you know bill you know, Bill was into it too. Bill always loved New Order and all that stuff. So we were trying to bring that into the music a little bit more with Tactical. Caustic was a little more in your face, a little more high energy. And I think with Tactical, we were trying to like make it a little more slick or something, a little more polished and uh, have, you know, more song-like structures and stuff like that. That's what I was always into is having it like a you know, a song structure, an arrangement, a bridge, a chorus, a verse, all that. Right. Out of curiosity, uh, how did you guys get away with all the samples and did you have to clear them all back in the day? <laughs> Just did it. I don't know. Didn't even think about it. Didn't even think about it. Never even crossed our minds, you know, because we came from, you know, our original influences from the old you know, original industrial days with like Cabaret Voltaire, where they're just using whatever they want. No one talked about sample clearance. It was like it never even, even, even old hip hop didn't do it. They just took whatever. Eric B and Rakim, they're taking old record loops. It was just a different time. You know, sample clearance became a thing later when people started having big hit records. Then someone went, hey, wait a minute. Once there was money to be made, then it became an issue. When you're putting out these underground records, no one cared, you know, whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah. That and first, you know, I, I think that first successful white zombie record was probably the tipping point where they had they got in trouble. But oh no, I think it was records. MC Hammer. Oh, sure. And like like once big records were, you know, once people have a hits with samples, then someone started figuring everything in the music business comes to money. Right. If you're making your underground art and, and, you know, no one's making a ton of money, that's fine. That that's cute. Just just keep doing that. Right. No one cares until there's money around and then everything changes. So we we didn't worry about it. I mean, again, you know, Bill was in Skinny Puppy. I was you know, we we're around that scene. They sampled what the hell ever they wanted. I mean, Warlock has a Beatles sample on it, for Christ's sake. You know, the only thing I can think of that helped them was the uh, capital was putting out their records in America. So maybe that helped them a little bit, but there was no, we never talked about clearing samples. That's a way later generation thing. So we just did whatever and whatever we thought we thought sounded good. And so there was no issues of that for us back then. Well, thank goodness. Um, thinking back on, on tactical now, do you have a favorite most memorable track for you personally? Or? Oh, cast. To me I too. <laughs> that's okay. mine too and i'll tell you not just because the track's a banger I, it's got my favorite sample of all time which is the hannibal lecter sample from silence of the lambs right go is that now. what that is agent starling go go now that's you know, okay you know what's funny this is the other funny thing about making these records is bill has always been a big you know movie guy i guess you could say and he would have a dat machine in the living room and he would watch movies and then just kind of run the dat recorder and then he would take dat tapes into the studio and i would just go through them and take pieces and i wouldn't know what they were half the time because 
so that even though he is crazy, go now. I didn't know what it was from. I just thought, oh, that sounds a good one. That sounds good. Let's grab that. So that was a funny thing about a lot of the stuff Bill and I did is Bill, we sort of had different things we did. You, you know what I mean? Like I was more of the programmer, at arranging, playing like string pads, doing, Bill would sort of come in with the general concept. He'd have some samples, maybe he'd play a bass line, you know, so we, ha- we each have different roles, right? And then he'd do the vocals. So he would sort of like, come in with a dat tape that he had spent the last few nights you know renting movies and recording stuff and i would just go through it and every once in a while go, i like that and then sample that so it was like on my part it was very naive approach i didn't even know what the source was half the time it would just be like that sounds good let's grab that so i actually can't believe i didn't know that was (laughs) sir anthony hopkins on it's like I'd be on tour and people would say, oh, you sample that. I'd be like, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't not, even. Not, not to mention, serious. yeah, not <laughs> to mention serial killers right at your target audience. Good call there. Uh, Bill, Bill knows his, uh, his target audience for the listeners. as you. Well, that comes from, you. that also comes from the skinny puppy era when Bill was with puppy and it was the horror movie thing. And then, I mean, that was this, you know, a friend of, of both bands, Gary Smith, who used to be in a band with Kevin Key. Um, he's not, he's in the movie industry and he was a big horror movie fan and he was trying to make a horror movie. And that's where the video from Virus, those clips came from a trailer. So there was always that kind of connection. And, um, but yeah, I didn't know about the, uh, a lot of wh- where, um, you know, where, Bill had recorded this stuff or exactly what movie it was. It was just like, and we were, we recorded some stuff. We sampled some stuff from some pretty cheesy movies too, like free Jack and stuff like that. <laughs> Cause like, I think Bill would sometimes rent movies just knowing there'd probably be something in here, you know, it like, even if it means having to sit through watching Mick Jagger act, at least we could probably snag something out of it. <laughs> Amazing. Great work there. Uh, just just as we wind this down, I want to give you back the rest of your day. What do you have on tap that you can share for 2023? Um, oh, yeah, big one. Um, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the project called Cyberactive. It was Bill and Kevin Key from Skinny Puppy. Wow, we are making a new album with the three of us. And so far, uh, it's, it's pretty exciting. It sort of sounds, I think it sounds more Skinny Puppy than Frontline. So it's sort of sounding a little more like Skinny Puppy with Bill on vocals. It's pretty good. And uh, I don't want to say too much. I don't want to give away too much, but we're all excited. All three of us are very excited about this record. And for whatever reason, it just all really came together. And um, we're kind of in the later stages of that now. Um, I'm just kind of editing some vocals and stuff, and then we're going to get it mixed and hopefully it comes out later in 2023 but that record is um i think fans of this genre will will appreciate this record it's uh i don't think either party has done either camp has done a record like this in a long time so that's pretty exciting and then i'm producing some stuff i'm producing a group called bestial mouse uh, and I'm trying to change that. I mean, it's a bit more of a dark, gothic y kind of, but interesting vocals. So I'm working on that now and I'm kind of putting my spin on it. I'm always working on stuff under my own name, my sort of solo techno stuff. Um, we have a new Delirium record we finished like over the last couple of years that's coming out. Um, probably some more frontline touring. Um, we're not 100% sure on any of that. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of things coming back to tactical for a minute. Fun fact, tactical was mixed in Paul Dean's studio, Paul Dean being the guitar player from Loverboy, And we mixed it in his studio and every, every frontline record in the nineties almost has a connection to some mainstream kind of rock band or something so we mixed tactical at paul dean studio um we mixed hardwired at brian adams studio 
when we finished Costa Grip, Queensryche were loading in. So there, <laughs> there's always these weird connections to like mainstream rock with frontline records. Like, uh, but that's what I always, that the, the studio we did Tactical at didn't last that long. Paul had to set up a commercial studio and then he moved it into his house. Um, and which I actually worked at with another band too. But yeah, we always had some connection and cause that's what I mean. Vancouver had, you know, the big dogs in Vancouver would make world-class studios like Brian Adams, you know? And so uh, the songwriter, Jim Valance, who was Brian Adams writing partner, he owned the studio Armory Studios where we did Millennium, right? So there was always these kind of weird mainstream rock connections in the background to all these frontline records. And uh, that, that's what I mean. We were benefits of that element of Vancouver. Vancouver was always quietly like a big, big, it still is. It still is like, uh, there's the warehouse, which is Brian's studio. I mean, like Shakira, REM, like lots of people have made records there still. So, so we were the yeah, beneficiaries of that background mainstream uh, studio element of Vancouver. So that's something I always thought was kind of cool, you know, that uh, tactical neural implants SSL console was paid for by working for the weekend. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh my I God. love stuff like that. And such a good song, actually. I like I like some pop music. I'm not gonna lie. Who doesn't love the 80s stuff? And uh, oh, me too. I grew up I grew up with that yeah. music in the background. I always mm -hmm. turn me loose by lover boys completely takes me back to being like 12 years old going to hockey practice in Vancouver. It's dark at four o'clock. It's always raining. And that song is playing in the background. And every time I hear that song, it takes me right back to that. So I sort of like it. <laughs> nice. Time for the skate around. Really quick, this just spurred one last thing in me, if you'll humor me, which is that I think about all the bands Frontline specifically has influenced across a lot of different subgenres, metal, you think? dance music. Yeah, I, don't, I know so. Uh, oh, okay. I think I've lived it a little bit. And I was going to say right now, we have all these sort of little percolating subgenres that I hear Frontline in. I hear Frontline in Carpenter Brood. I hear Frontline in Ghost, the popular heavy metal band. I hear Frontline in Ghost, the te the electronic music band. I hear Frontline in a lot of these things. And a lot of metalheads love this music. So I always wondered why, why do you think metalheads particularly love electronic and dance music and hard beat music? Why? I think Fear Factory started that. I think it's from Fear Factory. I mean, because when we did demanufacture, that was not the case. That was, I mean, there would be the odd person. Like there was a couple people at Roadrunner and I'm, I'm talking like two people out of the whole staff on Lafayette Street there. I think you know what I'm talking about. Um, I, I really think Fear Factory had something to do with that because when we did demanufacture, there were not a lot of metal bands putting like, I mean, there'd be bands with keyboards for sure, right? But not with like sequencing and like really electronic -y music elements. So I kind of think that might've had something to do with it because listen, no disrespect to any band. And I don't know if I'm talking out of turn here, but I didn't hear any sequencer intros on In Flames records till after Demanufacture. So I'm not sure if that's connected. I don't want to say it is, I don't want to be presumptuous, but I didn't hear metal bands with sequencer intros until after that album, but I could be wrong. And I don't want to speak out of turn if I am wrong, but I think that had something to do with it. I think it, I think it made it acceptable because like I said, I remember in the, you know, in, in those days, what Dino wanted to do was a bold move. You know, I want this in, and, and the funny thing was when Dino, when we did Demanufacture, Dino wasn't even talking about industrial bands. He was talking about rave music, like Prodigy and Messiah. And he wanted that. Not The industrial thing was, yeah, we love Skinny Puppy. We love all this stuff, but we want this too. So that's sort of different, you know, that's like, so I could be wrong because I'm not sure. Um, but it definitely, when we toured with Hardwired, we had expanded our audience substantially by being connected to metal. And so it, it was really just within a couple of years that changed. But actually, now that you say this, Shane from Napalm Death was always big 
he loved part line. He loved puppy. He had that meat hook seed thing. So maybe, maybe it was always, I mean, when I first heard Sodom, you know, the band Sodom, when I first, I didn't like metal when I was a, a, a teenager in the eighties, there was two different worlds. You know, these were guys that wanted to kill me at high school, you know? So it was like two different worlds. And then like, I started hearing certain things like I, I liked, you know, I liked old Metallica, I liked Slayer because it was aggressive. It was more because I came from originally a punk background. And so that stuff sounded more like punk to me. Right. And then when I first heard Sodom, it was so it was so thrashy and so raw. I thought this almost sounds like throbbing gristle. This is almost <laughs> industrial. Right. So I can I don't know. I mean. I think people just realize that the darkness and the energy is not that different. It's just maybe a different instrument. I don't know, but I also think Fear Factor opened a lot of doors and Nine Inch Nails and, and ministry. It's nice work. Yeah, I can't, uh, there's no uh, argument with any of that. I really yeah. appreciate that last answer. And, uh, you know, it's just been, uh, you know, tremendous chatting with you today. Uh, Frontline Assembly, Reese Fulber Tactical Neural Implant is re-out again on Wax Tracks Records as a new version, a remastered vinyl. Go out and get it wherever you get your vinyl folks and nerds. And uh, just thanks for hanging out with Ghost Cold today. This is a real thrill chatting with you. Thank you so hey, much. Hey, my pleasure. Absolutely. It's nice to, nice to chat. And uh, I hope you got what you needed. And... <laughs>